Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on investing in Africa's transition to net zero. I'd just like to briefly introduce the host and chair for this session, Wendy Miles, who is a barrister and King's Counsel at 20 Essex, also the chair of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative, and also representing the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, who have facilitated this session today. So I'll hand over to Wendy now to introduce the rest of the panelists. Thank you so much, Nick. And I should start by introducing you. So Nick's a knowledge broker at Hughes Hall uh, Centre for Climate Engagement at Cambridge University. So he's our online moderator. Thank you very much, um, Nick. We've also got uh, Shanaz Aslam, who's a lecturer of public law at the Ain Shams University Faculty of Law. And she's the rapporteur for our session. So hi, Shanaz, and thank you very much for joining us. And we have Madonna Sobi, who's an assistant lecturer, lecturer also at Ain Shams uh, Faculty of Law, and she's our Zoom moderator. So, so she'll help manage our Q&A at the end. So we're looking forward to that. Now, our speakers, um, we have uh, four speakers, but two are with us now. So we're just hoping our next two um, arrive in time. But our speakers that we have thus far are, um, we have um, Nina Pendham, who is the, Vice Chair of the UK um, Environmental Law Association, but she is also a barrister, a planning administrative law um, environmental barrister at Cornerstone Chambers. Did I get that right? I did. No? <laughs> no, I'm sure they'd love to have me, but I'm, all, I'm at number five Chambers, Wendy. <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> That's Nina. <good> point. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> Number five chambers, misadvertising in the first three minutes. So let's see if we can do better with Justine. Justine Sweet is at Herbert Smith Free Hills, and um, Justine's a consultant there, specializing also in environmental and regulatory law, operating from the Johannesburg office. And we are additional two speakers who we hope will be joining imminently. And if you see my me checking, um, um, Fatma Karume from Tanzania, who is a former president of the Tanganyika Law Society, um, qualified lawyer, also in the United K, barrister. We're a bit barrister heavy this panel, um, and she um, she'll be joining us um, as soon as possible. And we also have, hopefully, joining us Eric Kasong who is the director of the Congolese Centre for Durable Development um, and focused on uh, research um, on climate change governance adaptation. So I'd like to kick off um, this, this panel. What, what we're talking about here is investing in Africa's transition to net zero, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a teasing title because it, it, it's really focusing on investing in Africa's role in transition to net zero. And I think that's a much more important um, nuance to put on this because the reality is anybody who has seen the wonderful graphic and had I, had I not been in the middle of COP negotiating rooms, I would have gotten it for the screen, but the graphic of the carbon footprint, the literal footprint, it shows the African states just in the corner of the heel. So 54 tiny little dots of the states and you know, the US alone is this massive heel. And so um, comparatively and in absolute terms, Africa's um, as a whole, 54 states in Africa's footprint is tiny. We have Fatma with us. Welcome Fatma, we've only just begun. And I'm just giving um, a, a little bit of an overview. So hopefully you can get your screen and your speaker on and hopefully you can hear us. So we, um, um, so, so what we have learned in, in our work with African commercial lawyers, international commercial lawyers in Africa is our footprint is not the world's problem. And I think that is the first and most important takeaway that, 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 that um, we should all use as our departure point from this. Um, the second point is, while Africa's carbon footprint is not the problem, Africa's natural wealth footprint is the solution. So we don't get to decarbonize the global north, the developed countries, the big systems that have been responsible for the heavy carbon footprint without the natural wealth that's extracted from 
African countries, but also from a lot of other developing or less developed countries. So an interesting um, sort of pivot that, that we made in the work with the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance and working with commercial law firms like Herbert Smith Freehill was really to understand that our conversation with the um, African lawyers involved in international trade and investment in particular is uh, not what we thought it was. It isn't what can we do to help you, but it's what can you do to help us. And so um, one thing I, one way I like to put it is really the cards aren't in the global North's hands on transition. The cards are in the hands of those states that hold that finite natural wealth and human resource capital as well. So in terms of wealth accounting, we spend too much time on dollars and not enough time on natural, natural wealth, human wealth. So if we could shift, I think, just to segue from that, Nina, if, if we could just get you to sketch out the project that we're working on uh, that was inspired by working with lawyers from South Af uh, from, from Africa um, to, to try to map what we hope could become a bit of a comparative guidebook with a difference. So whereas historically we've seen a lot of comparative guidebooks for how investors protect their own money when they're investing in Africa, again, we're trying to pivot that so it becomes the African guidebook um, on, on how, how you get a hold of our resources if you want them. So Nina, on to you. Thanks, Wendy. And I, I'm grateful you for that long introduction to help me get this up. Um, it, it, I want to get it right. It, it's fundamental. Um, I completely agree with everything you've said in that excellent intro. Um, and just to have a nice succession from the earlier um, session. I also agree entirely with what Professor Kibugi um, said about how we can't transplant the law from the global north to the global south. It, it's not for us to superimpose our norms on the global south. We do need to assess local laws and jurisprudence, and that's at the very heart of the project um, that I'm going to outline. This is a partnership, um, uh, but very much led by our African um, uh, participants. So we're looking at a, designing a toolkit um, that will consist of locally derived information. That's crucial. So we will have that input, that assessment of local laws and jurisprudence um, with the benefit of specialist African lawyers within each jurisdiction. The goal is, um, we're, we're ambitious ladies, to get uh, all 54 countries um, on the African continent involved with this. And we're going to identify uh, investment opportunities, risks and procedures within these incredibly diverse 54 nations. Um, as I said, developed with those in-country experts um, in partnership, of course, with lawyers from the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance to help investors efficiently identify opportunities for investment across Africa in a net zero aligned way. And by net zero, I mean um, uh, the goals, the identified um, aims and, and goals of the individual jurisdiction um, in which that investment will be placed. So again, not imposing anything external um, on that um, investment opportunity, that framework that we'll be setting out in the toolkit. Um, I hope I've explained that um, enough. I don't want to take all the time this morning. Absolutely, perfectly. We can come back into a little bit of the detail. So, so Justine, from, from um, working in Africa in particular, and South Africa gets an awful lot of attention and um, particularly here at the COP, it's almost the conduit to investment into Africa. I mean, does that just, just channel everything again through one country rather than recognizing the 54 countries? But, but so South Africa is a little bit different. It's a little bit more sophisticated, uh, higher carbon footprint, a little more sophisticated with its own industry, already has carbon pricing mechanisms. Um, so question for you is how important for African policymakers, African lawyers, is decarbonization of South Africa um, versus just mobilizing these resources for investment? I'm, I'm sorry, could I ask you just to repeat the question? I had a 
I had a challenge on my side with uh, Loach hitting here. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. The question was, is, yeah. is, is, is South Africa um, different as, as a bit of a conduit to a lot of the investment capital industry production of power for, for other African states? Is South Africa in a different position in relation to its contribution to decarbonization versus in South Africa versus um, its role in what it can do to assist the rest of the world and what can be done to assist it to transition to green energy in particular? So for me, I mean, I think I think you touched the nail on the head when you um, mentioned that South Africa is obviously the, the biggest carbon emitter in, um, in Africa. In addition, it's the third largest economy in Africa. So I think that that puts it in a fairly critical place. But let's also bear in mind that um, South Africa has also recently, well, not recently, I suppose it was in Glasgow last year already, um, signed the Just Energy Transition Partnership Agreement in terms of which it has been allocated $8.5 billion to help with seed money to enable a just transition in the um, South African context particularly. And I see that very much as a precedent setting opportunity for the rest of Africa. Um, so it's a learning opportunity, but it is also an opportunity for South Africa to reduce its emissions, um, which will help bring down the rest of the African continent's emissions significantly. And if I could just uh, give, give you yeah. just feedback on, on what's happening with that partnership. So South Africa has published its draft investment plan, which is looking great. And I think that uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa will be speaking to that um, during the, the COP proceedings. But in addition, and, and perhaps on the ground, it's quite significant that one of the ESCOM power stations, which are the primary contributor to emissions in the South African context, has recently been decommissioned and it's going to be repurposed in a renewable energy space. So again, another opportunity to learn um, and for the rest of the world to learn from, from this scenario. I also think South Africa as one of the dominant role players in um, the African continent can help other African countries in terms of leading policy direction and change. And I know that that's um, quite important given the fact that our president plays a significant role in the African Union. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Justine. We'll come back to you. We have Fatma. Hello, Fatma. Welcome. Hi, Wendy. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you so much Excellent. for joining us. We've, um, we've, hopefully you've heard the conversation, even though we weren't letting you speak or be seen during, <laughs> during the opening gambit, but um, hopefully you heard. And so what, what we were talking about was really this juxtaposition between African states obligation under the Paris Agreement to decarbonize like the rest of the world versus Africans states role in actually enabling the rest of the world to decarbonize through the provision of, of natural resources. Now, Justine, we've just been talking about South Africa and Justine's helped us to understand in a little bit more detail why South Africa is a little bit different in terms of its um, need to decarbonize just because of the size of its relative carbon footprint compared to the rest of Africa. Now, Tanzania, very little development um, outside the extractive industries. Um, what is, could you just quickly um, give us a sense on the ground of Tanzania's sort of the focus of policy, government, business, industry on decarbonization in Tanzania by Tanzania? So um, we've obviously signed up to uh, net zero by 20, 
um, 20, uh, 2030, uh, 2050. Um, so we've agreed to that. However, we have enormous challenges that I think uh, one has to be aware of. Uh, access to electricity for the entire population in Tanzania is 26.2%. Urban population is 57.8%. Rural population is only 11.5% access to electricity. Um, now, that may not look so bad if you have a small rural population. Our rural, rural population is 64.05% of our entire population. So when you put that into perspective, the majority of the people in the United Republic of Tanzania have no access to electricity. Now, where do we get most of our energy from? We get 65.8% uh, of the little electricity we produce from oil, gas, oil and gas. We don't produce uh, any coal electricity. We have gas fields in Southern Tanzania. We use gas for, for electricity and we also use um, imported oil. Um, we do have hydropower which is at 35%, we're at the moment also undergoing rationing, power rationing of some sort, because we are in drought, in a drought situation in Tanzania. So we have power rationing, we have water rationing. Um, and obviously the one can blame um, um, the, um, our carbon footprint and what we're doing to the world and all this. Um, however, when you look at what is going on with respect to um, investment in, in um, clean energy in Africa, only 2% of all global clean energy investment comes into Africa. But we need, we have a dearth of, um, we have a need for energy, a huge need for energy. Uh, we have the natural resources, um, we have um, the, 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 you know, the Africa's solar power potential alone is 7,900 gigawatts. So yeah. we have potential for solar power. We have potential for wind power. We have potential for um, uh, sustainable, sust sustainable um, hydropower. We also have potential for geothermal. In Kenya, 25% of its uh, power pr pr is produced by geothermal. So the potential is there. We're just not getting the investment. And the reason we're not getting the investment, one of the reasons is the cost of investing in Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is quite expensive. Uh, so we have to look into those questions. And I think, you know, there are things that we as Africans can do to bring down costs of in investment and to attract investments in these areas. And I'd like to come back to what those things are um, in a moment and then to, to Justine as well, and then, then come back to Nina on, on how the, the, the manual might, might help, um, um, help remove that blocker. But I just want to layer in the, the additional ingredient here, which is, so keeping you Fatma just for a moment, layering in the, um, the green minerals and metals. Now I know the rest of the world calls them the critical minerals and metals, but I now know from the African green mineral strategy that um, Africa calls them the green minerals and metals. And the, um, the focus there is on, um, I, I've, learned just at COP recently that there's an African mining vision from 2009, there's an African commodity strategy, there's an African resource for energy framework, and there's the African green minerals strategy. And some, some of the um, proposals that are out there, for example, in the UNCTAD, the UN um, um, Trade and Development Commission, uh, report on least developed countries, for, of which South Africa and Tanzania are not, but, but 12 African states are, for the least developed countries is to penetrate that power market that you're talking about, Fatma, that green energy um, sort of the um, energy sources where, where there is no energy, populating that green 
power um, source in combination with beneficiation projects of minerals and metals. So for example, if there is a wind project, a solar project, a green hydrogen project that enables further beneficiation of, of the raw materials before they leave um, African states, then that could that that um, that um, refiner or 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 um, um, processing company entity or even the mine with its extraction power operations could become the anchor customer for a new power purchase agreement type um, uh, financial model. Now all of this assumes a grid, and and I would. I, I would like to come back to that on the rural community on, on whether or not grid is necessarily the right approach, but just give me, let me give, put a couple of more models out there. There's the beneficiation power, public, um, power purchase agreement linkage. So that's model one. There's another model, which is talked about a lot less here and a lot less by the global North of retained African ownership for longer in the natural resource. So the type of model would be what we've seen with oil and gas eventually with the NNPC in Nigeria, Saudi Aramco, those types of models where you, you keep the um, where you keep the oil company, um, where you keep the, I'm sorry, I just saw Madonna look at her watch. Are we okay for time? We are okay for time. We have time. Let's okay, do. thank you. Sorry. Um, so the so the retention of ownership, so joint venture type type relationships, but a, a public private partnership that that retains a lot more of the ownership in that natural wealth, in either the state or nationals from that state, um, further through the process. Another model is more improved securitization of natural resources. So taking those resources and reserves that sit in the, um, the, um, the national um, sort of property and using those before they're extracted, before they're sold um, to securitize investment. And then a fourth model, potential model, is to um, come off the commodity market. So one of uh, a lot of African um, net exporters of capital's vulnerabilities is um, very, very pro subject to the commodities market. And when carbon pricing mechanisms like carbon border adjustment mechanisms in Europe start to come into play, that's really going to affect that supply chain, the origin Progress. and, and, and how, how, how the... Um, how the, the market, the market um, for, for those commodities and the price on that market. So they're just four models that sort of I've picked up um, in, in chat um, across the COP in the course of this week. But Fatma, question for you is this. We saw, in fact, we shared the experience of Tanzania basically gutting it's mining, natural resource, investment protection laws from 2015 to 2017 and rewriting them in a way that among other things really tried to prevent that base erosion and sort of improve the profit sharing of the government. And just one example was raw materials couldn't be exported, beneficiation had to occur um, in country. You've been through this, right? Um, it is is it leaving aside the Tanzanian model and laws in particular? Is the transition of legal frame in the natural resource mining industry um, open to a rethink? that ensures that there's that greater protection and retention of proceeds from the natural resources for the country where they come from, for the people, for the energy transition in those countries. Is that an opportunity and um, from your experience? So um, this is a very complicated question. 
because um, one has to look at, I think, uh, Wendy, um, the, the I, I think if you are open and frank um, and, and honest with investors um, with respect to your requirements as a country, um, then investors are, um, they know what they're getting into. They are going to do their models. They will, uh, they will calculate their risk and uh, their costs, okay? And the profits, obviously investors want profits. They're not doing this for charity. Um, the problem is when you tear up the rule book that they first invested by, um, this, and, and you decide to ignore the rule book and come up with new rules, um, it sends shocks in the investment world. And um, their whole, the whole investment model upon which they base the initial investment um, is disturbed and therefore it creates uh, uncertainty. And there's nothing investors hate more than uncertainty and uncertainty particularly caused by um, government tearing up rule books. Um, so I think there is, there is potential for all these different um, models that you set up. But as African governments, we have to be frank, we have to be clear, there has to be certitude from the very beginning and we have to stick to this, adhere to these models and not tear up the, the rule book in the middle of the game because investors find this extremely disturbing and it, it ricochets around the investment world. As a result, um, investment costs into our continent increase and people are less likely to invest in energy, something that we need because it's a long-term investment, you know, and we're in desperate need of renewable energy on our continent. And and just thanks, Fatma. And and I'm going to come back to an announcement we've just had from Canada shortly. But I, I did say I'd come back to grid. There's a lot of talk about um, the green transition for energy um, in Africa being all about grid. Um, for this, you know, 64% of the community in rural areas and a vast, vast geography in Tanzania, is grid power the answer or the only answer or is decentralized power um, solutions um, part, of, part of the answer? So what's really interesting um, in Tanzania, we have something called the Rural Electrification Agency. And it's a program that uh, is trying to electrify the rural areas. And it's, it's not centralized. It's very much decentralized. So they're looking at um, um, areas, uh, for example, um, I was involved in one particular project as, as, a, as an advocate, as, a, as an advisor, legal advisor, in which um, they were looking at a waterfall, hydropower, in a limit in, in a small area and um, and electrifying that particular village and neighboring uh, villages um, from the hydropower. So there's there are these small projects which are not centralized and we're not looking at central grid um, grid power that that are taking place within the rural electrification uh, program and and some of these programs are actually funded by private money as well so that's very interesting and we, we see this happening but they're very small scale these are not huge projects they're very small scale and it would be nice to see more money being invested in these areas uh, more private money because as you can imagine Wendy we our budgets are very constrained um, Tanzania's entire budget, development budget and recurrent expenditure budget uh, for the year 2022-23 is, is really in the region of about 18, 20 billion dollars. That is all we have. You know, that is, I was looking at Shell's, Shell's declared profits. Um, and Shell's making that 
in profits. That's all we have to spend on recurrent expenditures and expenditure, um, government recurrent expenditure, and also development ex expenditure. It's just not enough. And Shell's making that from pumping out oil. The, um, the, the irony the, of that, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, well, the other irony is I've just been um, presenting in the UNDP pavilion and they have a massive clock in there which is ticking over fossil fuel subsidies in dollars since COP26, and it's in the high six trillions. I, mean, I had to count the zeros to try and figure out what the number actually was. Um, yeah. Can we, do we, have we still got Justine? Um, I yes. know Justine's having lightning strikes and and intermittent <laughs> power, which which is exactly, um, perfectly um, segues um, back to you. So. So um, first of all, I'd like your reaction uh, on the, um, the um, architecture of mining laws and the nature of the um, public retention element of public-private partnerships in mining and whether there is any sort of rethinking of those models in South Africa. Um, and perhaps how South Africa would react if if other countries where where its businesses are investing were to change those models. Um, but then also it'd be good to hear a little bit more about um, the 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 um, power challenges um, in in industry, but also um, residential power in in South Africa. Sure, no problem. Um, so the South African minerals regime has actually been quite challenging um, in the South African context. I mean, our Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act um, is, is subject to sort of heated debate and it continues to be subject um, to that. Part of it um, has a, a charter which pertains to ownership of minerals, etc. Um, and, and that has been recently taken on legal review, and I think it will probably be redrafted. It may mean that that presents an excellent opportunity to make submissions on how, um, on how that um, legislation could actually speak to uh, a net zero type um, ambition. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is that in South Africa we have a very responsive presidential committee on climate change and that um, committee actually has overarching um, oversight of legislation and it for example is looking at the energy um, the energy regulatory reform process, et cetera. And I think, again, it would present a, a unique opportunity to make submissions in terms of the mineral sector itself. To speak to the South African um, energy regulatory context and the need for decentralization of a grid, et cetera, um, what I can tell you is that we have a pending amendment to the Electricity Regulation Act, um, and that will allow um, independent power producers. Can you hear the thunder in the background? Yeah. <laughs> that will allow independent power producers to sell directly to um, to purchasers, and that's that's a big thing in the South African context. It hasn't yet um, come into effect, but we're obviously very excited about that. We are already seeing a number of um, renewable energy project companies entering into private power purchase agreements with mines, for example, in yeah. order to sell renewable energy into their into the grid, which the mines are then entitled to take for themselves. Um, and the additional thing is that in the South African situation, although we have ESCOM selling as the primary electricity um, services provider, the, some of our local municipalities are in fact looking at ways to go off grid 
Um, and for example, the, the Cape Town or Western Cape government is, is looking at, at doing that and they are seeking um, submissions from independent power producers so that it will become a, a regional supply which um, yeah, and, and just as an aside, it is interesting that in, in Cape Town, particularly when the rest of the country is on load shedding, um, Cape Town are, are on a significantly less onerous load shedding regime because they already generate their own power via a hydro facility. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we're seeing that here in the UK, aren't we, Nina? That decentralization from, from you know, the whole um, so to work with the renewables mix here in the UK, it sort of it, it drives and requires localization um, of grids and power. Um, Nina, can we come back to you? Because I'm, I'm really hoping that you've been taking lots of notes for the <laughs> comparative guide, which, which, which we should add that although Nina is the extraordinary sort of coordinating and, and project managing the enterprise, which is massive, but don't tell her how massive because we need her to do it. <laughs> um, the, the, each of those chapters um, will be written by, by somebody from the country um, and, and possibly more than one somebody's. So the, the architecture of, of the comparative guide um, really starts by setting out the stall um, of energy needs, um, um, natural wealth, um, human wealth, um, um, sort of um, capacity uh, challenges, um, but, but really it's sort of setting out the stall. Um, here's how we can contribute to the rest of the world's transition. And, um, and then the, the next paragraph is, is um, the, the broad sort of nationally determined contribution, so the climate target for, for that particular state. But then it breaks down into these different frameworks that we've been talking about. And we'd really love some questions and answers, but we're still working on precisely what these template chapters look like, but they'll start to look a lot like what you're hearing in terms of the electrification sort of legal framework, the investment legal framework, as, as Fatma rightly says, investors look for um, investment stability protection. Um, so what, what does that look like under bilateral, multilateral investment agreements, but also the Investment Act in the country? The financial stability framework and Dr. Megan Bauman from King's College um, was hoping to join us, but unfortunately, um, had a clash, but um, but she's she's working on that financial framework. So so so, what are you thinking, Nina? Hearing all of this, I'm I'm so so pleased. When it's like you're in my brain, um, I, that you mentioned Megan Bauman. I um, the way I'm I'm conceiving of this is to lead to further her work, her pioneering work on um, legal readiness for climate finance, because there's. Um, quite a lot there that Megan's been working on in her academic activities. Um, but then also, and happily um, in alignment with what we've been hearing about um, uh, the initiatives in Africa, um, there are, there's quite a lot of scope for mutually beneficial assessments, both private and, and public. Um, so just taking the latter first, We've got um, a relatively recent research um, report published from academics at the University of Oxford. They were looking at the 250 largest firms in Africa. Of those, 127 had emissions targets. 50 had a net zero target by 2050. Um, but the great news is of that um, 50, the majority had it embedded in their corporate strategy. So that, that is a, a serious commitment by that firm um, to net zero. And um, I suspect we'll see more of those firms um, operating in Nigeria, um, having that sort of um, deep commitment to net zero because uh, I've been tracking it. I, I don't think it's published yet, but Nigeria's Climate Change Act published November last year 
um, mandated um, the National Climate Change Action Plan, five-year carbon budgets and an annual um, objective of, of emissions reductions. But what's fascinating about that act is that under um, Clause 24, Section 24, I believe it's called Clause in Nigeria, um, that mandates every private company with more than 50 employees to put in place measures to achieve the annual carbon reduction targets set out in that national private companies set out um, uh, in line with the national plan. Um, and there is a fine um, uh, if you don't do that. Uh, very, very interesting things happening in the private and public sector and the work that we'd be doing um, with local lawyers, which uh, this is not just Nigeria, obviously there's a lot of work going on in Africa um, generally, but um, a lot of interesting things happening there and, and opportunities for, for best practice learning back and forth. And then returning to Megan's work, um, Dr. Bowman's been doing some really, really fascinating things um, looking at where a country is or a, an investment um, opportunity is capable of um, attracting uh, climate finance in particular. So what are those baseline conditions and what needs to be done to strengthen that attractiveness? And she, um, came to a conclusion in summary, I'll be very brief, um, and I hope I do no um, disservice to Megan for this incredible research. Um, first, there needs to be coherent regulatory architecture in place. There needs to be domestic, technical, and legal expertise, and there needs to be institutional capacity. So that's needed um, as a baseline to attract and mobilize climate action, um, or climate finance at scale. And just as Fatma was saying, key to that is this stable um, regime and the um, protection from investment shocks in light of political vicissitudes. And then uh, Dr. Bowman recommended to maintain that and facilitate further investment. Um, one, to strengthen na national law uh, and regulations. Two, to pursue an integrated regulatory framework. So there, there needs to be that institutional right. coherence. Um, and thirdly, um, where necessary, these, these environments, these uh, um, areas that are seeking to attract climate finance need to seek support from multilateral financial institutions who will carry out regulatory mapping and help build tech and, and uh, technical and institutional capacity. And if I could just plug the next session uh, at 1435, where the International Bar Association and partners will be setting out um, some of the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, 1645, yes, well, there's two events. Th 1435 um, is the experts panel activating decarbonization in uh, an adaptation in legal practice. 1645 on the 12th of November um, in the Blue Zone, Thebes, 1645 Blue Zone, um, where that will be further discussed. So a lot of exciting work being done here. And, and we hope, Wendy, you and I, and um, our fantastic team to put this all together, all together in, um, in good use. Brilliant, brilliant. And the um, just to underscore that, sorry, we're having a discussion on the door. Our handle came off the door of our um, um, negotiating room the other day, and it um, we got locked in. But um, the <laughs> the um, um, the um, so so um, uh, I'll come back to it. Don't worry. Um, the uh, yes, the the talk, the the, the goodwill. The goodwill for for um, um, energizing Africa. It's not decarbonizing Africa. It's energizing Africa with decarbonized energy systems. Right. Hundred million Africans don't have electricity. It, that's unacceptable. Exactly. Exactly. So 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 then the um, there is tremendous goodwill um, to get there. This this COP has been in a lot of discussion about loss and damage. That's from a perspective of compensation aid. There's reluctance from from the large polluting states to 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 sort of lean in, you know, as as much as they may need on that. But um, but the um, um, this discussion and hopefully this handbook and the other material that the bar associations are working on preparing, what that does is helps, um, we hope, with the comparative guide across Africa, both governments and um, business people, business and industry within Africa to um, sort of help create 
those investable products rather than waiting for someone else to come and say, here's the investable product that I'm going to bring to you. Because part of the danger in waiting is I, Nina and I heard about a fabulous project in Namibia the other night at dinner. It's hugely exciting. The German government come into Namibia, put in a masses of, of hugely productive wind energy and solar energy in order to produce green hydrogen in the form of ammonia, which is then shipped out and shipped up to Germany to deal with Germany's energy transition and Germany's energy security problems. And I found myself wondering, and I didn't have an opportunity to ask, but how does that help Namibia? Yeah. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, so this is this, if, 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 if the solution doesn't come from where the solution is needed, <laughs> it, it probably won't be the right solution. So, so what we're just trying to do is facilitate what those modalities look like now um, across the different countries and, and help um, sort of try and put that um, first step towards um, a type of guide deal book um, together that can just work as a as another modality to investment. Um, Grid, um, Justin, can we come back on um, South? Oh no, you did, sorry, you dealt with South Africa and Grid. I just want to make a couple I, of questions. Oh yeah, go, go, go. I, I, did, I did just want to um, add to what you were saying. Um, I was quite interested in, um, in a speaker at a, at a recent conference that I was at who actually said, you know, Africa basically just needs to become an island if it can localize everything. Um, it it can uh, it it can deal with its its problems quite um, cleverly. And if you look at the fact that at the moment, for example, Namibia is shipping its green hydrogen to Namibia. I mean, to Germany. The idea would be that. Namibia should really be using that um, energy itself. That's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. And, um, you know, Germany's invested a lot of money, 10 to $15 billion. But again, what, what's Germany getting back for, for that investment? I don't know what the price is on the ammonia or, or, or how quite how that works. But, um, but I, I, I don't think it was a donation. Um, but... Um, but there are there are a lot of models, and everybody's thinking of models. But if if the you know the fifty four states individually want models that fit for work for meet the needs of the states and have an economic benefit to the states at least equal, then then you know the work's going to need to be done at, at that end of the negotiation um, just as much as the other end. And you know I've been saying the same thing about. Um, mobilizing finance for for net zero for decarbonization for transition to net zero that we we it's it's one thing to put all the pressure on the financial institutions particularly the private financial institutions and more on this in the session at the plenary session with mike strauss and others um at 3 45 today um on this on on this channel um the um the, the financial institutions don't make the decisions on where the investment, uh, on, on what invest, investment is done. And I liken it to if Nina and I decided, Nina and Fatma and Justine and I decided to set up a law firm, we wouldn't sit and wait for a bank to come to us with a business plan and tell us how they were going to finance us to, to set up a law firm. We would go to them, we would create it, we would work out what our, what our um, financial um, requirements were, and we would go to the bank and make the case. So we've got a we've got a question from Nada, who is um, another Ensham's um, student, and Nada's asked about um, with the financial and non financial barriers faced by investors um, in in African countries. Is it possible to reach near, net zero by twenty fifty? And I'm I'm going to assume Nada that you mean um, possible globally. Um, I mean that's a, that's a, that's a bigger question. Um, um, but I think Fatma, we I said I'd come back to you on this point in terms of um, the 
the requirements that you need in place to attract investment. Now, you talked about stability and stability of the investment environment, but you said there's other things that, that, that you can do as well. And I'd like to come back to those other things to do to remove those financial and non-financial barriers. So the question specifically, sort of taking Nada's question and specifically for Tanzania, what do you think Tanzania could do and should do to remove those financial um, and non-financial barriers? You've mentioned one, you know, don't mess with your law when you've, when you've set um, a stable regime out there, but what other ones? Um, thanks, Wendy. So, um, my, I think my favorite peeve, um, unfortunately, uh, which is rule of law. It is essential that um, in, in the case of Tanzania, that um, we really abide by the rule of law. This means that we require uh, an independent judiciary because um, Ultimately, nobody wants to invest in a country where um, they are subject to whims and not to, to the rule of law. People want predictability. And the beauty about rule of law is that despite, you know, uh, despite the fact that it's not a science, and, but it's predictable. There's a certain predictability. That's why we do what we do. Uh, we advise because we advise clients and then when we go to court in litigation we 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 know what the law says and what the chances of winning or losing are um and therefore there's a certain amount of predictability um so rule of law is essential and um also i think there has to be some kind of incentives or from government not you i think though we have to be careful with that slightly in the past, in the 1990s, um, what we did in Tanzania is we gave away a lot of incentives because we had, you know, in the 60s, we had tried other models um, to ensure that we benefit from our raw materials. Um, and we ended up ha uh, chasing away investors. We had we had a, a, a problem for quite a while. And therefore, when we got to the 90s, we started giving away incentives uh, to attract investors back. I don't believe that incentives are the be all and end all. Investors just want predictability. Incentives don't necessarily, it's a quick fix solution. But if you then are not predictable. If you're not predictable, the incentives mean nothing. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so predictability is very, very important. So rule of law, um, and 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 predictability. In and rule of law necessarily means that you need an independent judiciary, um, independent judiciary, in, independent bar, um, lack of inter, in, interference from government bodies. So these are very, very important. And also you need a legislative, legislative that is also independent from the executive where debate is free. Because you know, if you don't have an independent legis legislative, you then have, the executive can easily change laws. After all, you know, if we go back to, to uh, apartheid, if we go to South Africa, mm -hmm. apartheid was a law. Yeah. And it was passed by the legislative. And the legislative did not represent the population of South Africa. So um, we, the independence of the legis legislative uh, branch is of state is extremely important. And it has to be representative of the people as well. There has to be open debate. Um, so these are factors that anchor stability into an, a system and, and the, an investment environment that is stable. That's brilliant. Justine, anything to add? Um, yeah, so as, as much as I agree that regulatory certainty is absolutely critical, I also think that regulatory re reform is, um, is likely to be essential, particularly to improve investor confidence in, in certain areas. So 
for me, I know in the in the mining context, there is not um, sufficient certainty in terms of mining rights and that kind of thing. And those need to be made more certain. So I, I think that that will do a full circle and, and come back to um, achieving regulatory certainty. But I do think in order to attract investors, you need to look for legislation that may protect investors. So in the South African environmental context, there is potential provision for lender liability. Um, and while I appreciate that lender liability is, is certainly something which is an important driver to ensuring that lenders act correctly, it may also be something that um, dissuades investors from investing in, in certain areas. And I mean, we know in, in the United States, for example, that lenders have been um, given special protection. The additional um, component about enabling regulatory certainty is that if you can have a system that actually works and so with, with clear timeframes, et cetera, it enables project certainty. And one thing that lenders like nothing more is having project certainty in terms of timeframes being met, et cetera, and enabling an environment in which, for example, your regulatory approvals, et cetera, are provided in time is, is obviously critical. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, enabling environment is absolutely critical. So what we're finding, I think that's really important, Justine, and what we're finding in in Europe, for sure, in Spain, Italy, the UK, is the, the, the legal environment around transition is constantly changing, and investors are getting upset about it and are suing about it, but are not successful every time. And then my favorite um, little number is, the cost to Spain of not reforming its original solar power incentive regime was $25 billion. The cost to Spain in awards issued against it under investment protection for having changed those laws to escape that $25 billion so far has been $1.7 billion. And they haven't paid a penny of it yet. Um, because it's wow. mostly intra-EU claims. But that, that just goes to show that, you know, changing laws pays. Um, and, and on that, what I want to come back to was Canada's announcement on the 4th of November. And it's just, you know, it, I think, I think um, the African states should be careful not to set themselves a higher standard than the rest of the world in a transition, which requires change in regulation. And what Canada ordered on the 4th of November was divestment of for Chinese foreign investors in Canadian critical mining companies. So three mining companies in particular were ordered to divest in relation to investments that Canada said threaten national security and critical minerals supply chains in accordance with the Investment Canada Act. So if it's good enough for the goose, I think, um, then, 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 you know, it, it's, 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 it does lead me to wonder, you know, are we all holding Africa to, to a, to a different standard? Um, Fatma, anything to say on that? I find this extremely, uh, very interesting because actually, as a matter of course, the world is holding Africa to a different standard. Yeah. It's a, as a matter of course. Why do I say that? I'm saying that because, you know, I gave you the, the, the figures. Um, in Tanzania, almost uh, 57, 20, only 26% of our households have access to, to electricity. Now, we're now required to, to make sure that it's renewable by 2050. What well, we've signed up to it. But this is not the standard that the West was held up to. The standard that the West was held up to was, you know, to um, use carbon, um, um, coal. I mean, you could hardly walk in London at some point in the 50s um, because of the use of coal. Now, these are completely different standards. However, 
I think that with if we plan properly, we could leapfrog, which is fine. Um, leapfrogging is not a bad thing. It might end up being a lot cheaper financially for us to leapfrog. It might be much better. It will be much better for our environment. Um, so the standards are different, but we have to look at the costing of these standards. Um, is it much more expensive for us to leapfrog? Or um, it, can we do it in an inexpensive manner? Yeah. And of course, there's financial reward in doing it when all of these supply chain issues come down the pike. If, if you're the continent that's offering supply chain um, um, materials to, to build infrastructure that meets these multinationals, Global North, um, um, own declared standards, and they're going to get sued if they don't comply with them, then they're going to buy from Africa. So Africa could, could become, you know, this green market of the world. Estelle asked a question. We've only got three minutes left, but I'd love to, Estelle Dehon, um, QC from uh, the UK, barrister in the UK, has asked an excellent question. Have you given thought to the best ways to utilize in Africa the carbon offsetting money, which so many countries in the global north will be relying on using, um, uh, relying on using to offset their emissions? Can this be leveraged up in a positive way, both to lift up communities, e.g. electrification via renewables, or safeguard natural carbon um, removal, preventing deforestation, validly offsetting emissions? Um, or should we stay away from this because of difficulty in quantifying and verifying, and of course, the Kerry announcement, the big announcement yesterday by John Kerry was, um, I'm going to make the US companies pay for offsets, but the money that they pay, I'm going to put into this equivalent to a loss and damage type of fund. But but why wait for America to, to decide to give it or not give it if they have a change in government? You know, if, they, if, if the offsets are in Africa, <laughs> why not using that money? And Justin, just, just quickly to you, I know a bit of that is happening with the carbon pricing in um, the compliance mechanism, Estelle, rather than the voluntary carbon markets. But Justin, could, are you able quickly, do you have any concrete examples of where the collection of revenues from the South African carbon pricing emissions trading scheme has been applied in subsidizing development of green electrification or other transition projects? Sadly, sadly not. Um, oh. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I, would, I would love that to have been the case. And um, I, um, I've actually been sitting here thinking that's exactly what I need to get on my hobby horse about in terms of making sure that uh, that money goes into um, into real projects but at the moment um, for example the the uh, carbon tax um, goes directly into the fiscus and uh, just gets used for um, anything um, yeah it's, okay. it's not great, but one thing I, I can say, which um, is not exactly what you're looking for, is that uh, in terms of the renewable energy projects that get uh, submitted as part of the Independent Power Producers Program run by the Department of Mineral and Energy, you are required to submit social commitments um, and so those projects must implement certain community upliftment programs. So there is some benefit to the communities, albeit that it's not necessarily going into other climate resilient projects. Okay, well, that, that's good. That's a start. I know in Liberia, there's a massive forestry project going on now, which is a public private partnership, which is generating offsets that are supposed to the revenues are supposed to be going um into into upscaling um green energy Let, let's see how that goes but um but i think that let me leave with this to say thank you so so much we could i could be in this conversation as as some of us have already um for days and um, for hours um i i love it 
anyone who's listening who wants to get involved in the work that Nina's coordinating, we would love to hear from you because it's going to take a lot of boots on the ground. Um, the one thing I'll leave you with is this. Quite a few African states, and Fatma will be able to tell us precisely how many, have constitutions. And those constitutions protect human rights, protect indigenous people's rights. And um, Justine raises these, these broader issues and the broader ESG issues mustn't be run roughshod over in decarbonization. But you know what, what um, many African states have, that states like Australia and the UK don't have is a constitution to protect these fundamental um, human rights, indigenous people's rights. And I think they too are part of this legal architecture that, that Nina's um, group is mapping. And I think it's a really, really valuable and important anchoring for those broader ESG compliance commitments that so many investors and multinationals have made. So, so you know, I, I think there are wonderful tools for Africa to weaponize and really, you know, setting itself apart um, in this transition and driving its own transition, getting into the driver's seat, saying, okay, development banks, thanks for your help, but this is our transition and we're driving it and this is how it's going to be. So um, anyway, that's that's kind of what we're thinking. And um, if people like the idea, don't like the idea, we would love to hear from you because um, it's refining and we're developing all the time, but we actually want to produce something valuable, useful, additional to work that's already happening so thank you everyone so so much for listening and um as i say um, um if anyone wants to reach out through the organizers you can reach out you can get us and enjoy the rest of the day